computational physics is uh, sometimes fun. All day, every day, I sit at home and I write C++ code uh, for physics projects. Sometimes, uh, sometimes so much that uh, it almost feels like I'm more of a software developer for physics rather than a physicist. But identity crisis uh, aside, sometimes there are bugs that just floor me, that just stun me that frees my research for weeks. And I'm not talking about missing a semicolon or you know mistyping a variable name. I'm talking about those persistent, difficult to track down bugs that just refuse to be identified. The kind of bugs that make you question, did my code ever work before this? Is this all a lie? Do I even know how to code? Should I just delete everything in my project and start over again? Am I actually just a fraud? Perhaps an imposter? How did I fool people into thinking I'm good at this? Today I want to tell you about uh, my recent adventure uh, and the bug that caused uh, these roller coaster of emotions. So let's set the stage. I do lots of numerics on quantum spin systems. If you don't know what that means, or, or you don't care, uh, don't worry, it's actually not that important, aside from the following minor fact. The important thing to know is, is that when you represent maybe objects or things on your computer for these types of systems, the number of things that you need to store in your computer, in your RAM, they grow exponentially fast with the number of spins you have in your system or in your code or whatever you're trying to represent. For example, if you have uh, n spins, uh, storing a vector object would need two to the power of n complex doubles. So on a normal system, uh, a complex double is just a complex number and we store it with 16 bytes. So you can probably guess storing these things is pretty intense. Storing a vector for 30 spins, for example, uh, is something like 17 gigabytes of RAM. And uh, 30 spins is not a lot of spins. We sometimes need to store uh, matrices uh, as objects for these types of simulations. And instead of being two to the power of n complex doubles, you have to store two to the n by two to the n. At this stage, storing these matrices, we have to be a lot more humble with the amount of spins that we can actually uh, simulate. It's more like 15, maybe 16 if you really push your luck. So in the end, uh, this storage problem is one of the primary uh, or the biggest reason why uh, it's hard to simulate quantum systems uh, with a classical computer. This is, this is why we care about quantum computers. If we had a quantum computer, I don't know, my life would be a lot easier. And we can think about the code that I write as sort of being in three layers. Why three? Mostly because I'm a physicist. I code by myself. And for some reason, I code header files with thousands of lines of code and tons of random functionality all stuffed into one place. Uh, packed into one spot rather than actually following good coding practices. May get good results, but it's extremely messy underneath. First layer of this code we'll call the back end, which is just a fancy way to say uh, a few years ago I wrote some nice functions. I use these functions for every pod project. Uh, they are clean and have never failed me. The second layer is uh, new code. It is code I'm writing for my active pro uh, project as a postdoc at the University of Nottingham. You know, maybe it's a bit bit more carefree, you know, publish or perish mentality. You know, this code needs to work as soon as possible. You know, I of course do quality checks, but I mean, we're, we're, we're here to get results out. The third layer of code is the simple code I use to combine processes and pieces together uh, to form more complex algorithms, like maybe a power iteration or an Arnoldi uh, exact diagonalization or, so, or something like this. Right, right now I'm particularly interested in studying uh, extreme eigenvalue problems. And at the end of the day, my life as a computational physicist is super simple. My primary motivating factor is I want to stretch how many spins I can simulate in my program uh, to be the largest number of spins possible. It's a simple life. And sometimes this focus uh, at the current stage makes me feel a little separated from the physics. So there I was, chugging along, doing a nice solution for 24 spins uh, to get an answer for a question I was asking. I had to store a bunch of vectors. Uh, there was a supercomputer involved. 
And at the end of the day, the problem, every time uh, we increase the system size, we had to go up in steps of four. So uh, going from four, eight, so on, getting up to 24, we really only had uh, six data points, which is not a lot. So anyways, I had some tricks up my sleeves. You know, this is what I do. Uh, there's some symmetries in the problem. So I got to work and wrote a much better algorithm. And you know, this gets rid of some of our storage issues. We can add some more spins. Finished this and I went back and did a sanity check. I checked four spins. I checked eight spins, 12, 16, 20, 24. The new code matched the old code. So we were in business. The new code worked. So next off, we were into unexplored territories, 28 spins. So the code agreed with theory in the test case. For our purposes, basically, that means that the code outputted one. Sat there and I waited for like 30 minutes and then it printed the screen one. Okay, jump to 32 spins. We're in business. Code's running. Boom. Code prints out the number one. So we're rolling. Next up, 36. We are grabbing 128 gigabytes of RAM on a supercomputer, 40 CPUs. I'm just ready to witness a one come out of the console. And this is where the party ended. It shot out the number 0.08. Now at this stage, I've told you basically nothing about what I've been doing. You don't know that much about the algorithm or the code I wrote, but I'd be curious if just by hearing what I just told you, you could guess <laughs> the problem or the bug in my code. What could it possibly be? The code worked and it worked. It worked up to 32 spins. And then just by adding four more, it broke. So basically what was going on is the storage requirement trick made the code shrink the memory space from two to the power of n to something like two to the power of n divided by n. So we bought ourselves some space and we could do some more spins. And actually there were some other benefits. It actually made the problem behave better, which again reduced the number of space we had to store. In the code, some of the big steps are things like multiplying matrices, updating vectors, you know, standard linear algebra stuff. So I got to debugging. Why could this possibly go wrong? So one of the big problems of finding a bug at this level of your code, at this stress level of your code, is that every time I came up with a potential solution uh, and I tried to run a new code, um, it took hours for the supercomputer to accept my job. And then it took up to 12 hours for the code to finish and tell me if my code was right. So, Tests started coming uh, coming back. I was chopping up the code. You know, it works if I only run half of the code uh, in this way or that way. You know, the matrices that are supposed to be uh, unitary are definitely unitary. It looks like the code just doesn't want to work when I push everything together. So what is that? Is it overflow? Is it underflow? Is my matrix not filling completely? Am I not normalizing my matrices properly? This initial test of cutting up the code and trying to isolate the problem took like maybe a week. Then I had a moment of clarity. The jump from 32 to 36 spins is a major red flag. Older CPUs are 32-bit CPUs. So I Google and Google. I ask around, I ask friends and colleagues. Everywhere I checked for some reason at this stage told me that C++, the integers uh, are 64-bit. I even tested it on my machine, my local machine, you know, printed out my integer, eight bytes, 64-bit. And this stumped me. I, I was thinking there's no way, there's absolutely no way. There, there is, this cannot be a coincidence that my code broke here. The output always goes to 0 0.08. It's deterministic. There has to be a reasonable explanation for this. So I ended up going to bed that night extremely confused. And while I was laying there, I was just thinking, oh, there, like, it, it, just ha it, it, can't, it cannot be that the integer is 64 bit. That, that has to be the problem, right? So at about 2 a.m., I finally got out of bed and I went to my computer, I logged onto the supercomputer, and I asked the supercomputer, how big is your C++ integer? And the supercomputer told me, it is four bytes. It's a 32-bit integer. So why is this a problem? The largest value the integer could hold 
was something like 2 to the power of 31. While I was asking it to represent integers as large as 2 to the power of 36. Now let's make one thing <laughs> very clear here. On some level, on a major level, this is obviously my fault. I could have coded in a smarter way, and I could have never come across this fact that I'm now going to relay to you. Could have, for example, uh, as I did elsewhere in my program, very carefully uh, in my back end, I could have used something called a size T in C++. It's basically a long unsigned integer. It's quite literally made for indexing. It can always index any object that you can allocate memory to. My haste, I use the normal integer. A difference of two characters, three characters if you count the underscore. They were everywhere, literally everywhere. Thousands of lines of code with ints in them. But of course, this was super exciting. So I was very ready to fix the problem. Instead of going to bed, I immediately basically, you know, control F, replaced every integer I could that it made sense to that was indexing something with a size T. I was ready to add those extra four spins to my system. And maybe, maybe, even added four more after that. Changed all my code, every index to a size T, and I sat there waiting, ready to see that number one be printed to my screen. And it didn't print a number one to my screen. It printed 0 0.12. So this, at this point, might have been, I don't know, two and a half weeks of me spending every waking hour attempting to fix this code rereading the same lines over and over. Finally messaged my supervisor and was like, listen, <laughs> I'm out of ideas. I, I need help. We brainstormed some new tests, talked about how it was absolutely a horrible idea that at one point I was starting to implement my own matrix uh, multiplication algorithm, uh, and then talked about, you know, potentially moving on to a new algorithm. But I wanted those spins. I wanted those four spins. <laughs> Needed to find the problem. If I didn't find the problem, how could I possibly move on? How could I sleep or do other problems with that completely morale-breaking bug? I don't know. It's a, it's a problem. It's just something deep inside of me wouldn't let me move on. I needed to know where this bug was coming from what is causing my code to break. I had all the space required on my computer for these spins. I was going to make it work. Several more days pass. I run more and more tests. And I finally, finally, finally narrowed the problem down to one line of code. And it was the place I never thought to check. It was the workhorse of my research, my back end. But why? the code that had never broken in years, what was possibly wrong with it? And looking at this line of code, following all, back all of the calls, I was like, there, there's nothing wrong with this code. Like this, this code looks fine. And then while messaging a friend on Discord, I copy and pasted function. And my, my eyes had read this function multiple times. I pasted it in Discord asked why is this wrong, and then immediately saw the culprit. The code that I had written and never questioned, hidden in thousands of lines of code that I tore apart, I had rewritten many times. I passed the first index as a size t to this function. And then, for who knows what reason, literally probably two seconds later, I wrote the function so that the second index was passed as an integer. So the three week saga was over. I, for the millionth time, booted up my connection to the supercomputer, re-uploaded my code, ran it, and I got back a one. So apparently Unix and Linux systems will often or usually have 32 bit integers in C++. So today I learned this seems to be for some backwards compatibility type things, uh, but like, <laughs> I don't know if like when I check on my Windows machine, it's a 64-bit int. 
Never did it occur to me that these things weren't standardized. Apparently they're not. They are kind of standardized. There are suggestions. So I don't know what the moral of this story is. Uh, I just wanted to tell it for some reason. It was a roller coaster for me. A roller coaster all because I lazily wrote an int instead of a size T like years ago. And there's something strange about the feeling of catching these bugs. Because at the end of the day, my code finally works. I'm doing something, you know, cutting edge. But I just wasted three weeks of my time because I wrote int two seconds after writing the correct data type. But I guess in some sense, these highs and lows are really, you know, the day to day of being a computational physicist. Uh, and I also imagine of being a software developer. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment below.